all right good morning everybody so today we will be seeing about the heart okay the human heart is made up of four chambers it's made up of four chambers and is roughly cone in shape okay the shape of the heart is cone shape and is the size of one's own fist it is located between in the mediastinum okay what is this mediastinum mediastinum is the space between the two lungs okay the space between two lungs is called mediastinum because it is cone shaped there is a base and an apex okay there is the base of the heart and an apex of the heart the apex of the heart is below whereas the base is above okay to be more precise it is in the posterior part the base of the heart is in the posterior part whereas the apex is below okay in below means where exactly it is located the apex is located 9 cm from the midline at the level of the fifth intercostal space okay so if you take a midline in the body okay and 9 cm on the left side obviously it's on the left side okay at the fifth intercostal space what do you mean by the fifth intercostal space that is the space between the ribs first intercostal space is between first and second ribs second is between second and third ribs third intercostal space is between third and fourth ribs okay fourth is between fourth and fifth and fifth is between the fifth rib and the sixth rib okay so this is the external feature of the heart so you can see that the heart is located in the mediastinum between the two lungs this part is called the apex of the heart any doubts okay next one no okay, no the heart is covered by a fibrous layer okay it is covered by layer which is called as pericardia peri means outer cardium means heart so the heart has been covered by the outer aspect by pericardia this pericardium has got an outer layer and an inner layer the outer layer is called the fibrous layer because it is made up of large number of fibers and the inner layer is called as serous layer okay so there are three layers actually which covers the heart okay the fibrous layer serous layer then what about the next layer the serous layer is actually two layers so parietal layer and visceral layer okay the visceral is the innermost layer which is close to the heart next will be parietal next will be fibrous layer okay so there are three layers which covers the heart fibrous layer okay which is the outermost layer and the inner serous layer which is divided into parietal and visceral okay now what is this what is this why this pericardium is protected so much because the heart is located between the lungs the lungs they keep on moving so when they keep moving they should not damage the heart so that's why there is a good protection there is a fibrous layer parietal layer and a visceral layer okay between the parietal and the visceral layer there is a space and this space is occupied by the pericardial fluid okay so the space between the parietal and the visceral layer is uh, it contains a fluid which is called as pericardial fluid okay to prevent friction okay as well as to provide nourishment to the heart now this is a condition in which the pericardial fluid is increased okay so here you can see 
the heart okay and in which the pericardial fluid is present okay only normally only little ml is present only small amount is present but when the amount of pericardial fluid increases okay when the amount of pericardial fluid increases this is called as pericardial effusion okay pericardial effusion okay which means the pericardial fluid which is located between the parietal layer and the visceral layer is increased. Now there could be many reasons for this pericardial effusion, including infection. Okay. And if it occurs suddenly, say for after a blunt trauma, okay, say a person who a football player who is playing and suddenly he gets a blow in his chest okay the pericardium is damaged and then the blood accumulates very fast in the pericardium it's called as cardiac tamponade okay cardiac tamponade both the conditions are same okay pericardial effusion slowly the fluid accumulates in cardiac tamponade it accumulates very fast okay now so what if the pericardial fluid is more what happens because when the pericardial fluid is more, there is no space for the heart to beat effectively. You know the function of the heart is to pump the blood. Okay, so when the heart doesn't pump enough blood for the body, then the person will collapse. Okay, so that's why this condition is to be noted down importantly. Okay, so pericardial effusion, which is slowly building, and cardiac tamponade, which occurs sudden. Okay, so there will be a sudden increase in the fluid between the parietal and the visceral layers. All right, any doubts until now? So pericardial pericardium has got outer layer and an inner layer. Outer fibrous What's layer. What's the name of this fluid? What's the name of the fluid? Pericardial fluid. Okay, so the outer fibrous layer and inner serous layer. Okay, the inner serous layer is between the parietal and the visceral layers. Okay, and they contain the pericardial fluid. Okay, normally only very little amount of pericardial fluid is present to prevent the friction, but in case of infections or trauma, it can increase. Okay. So if it increases slowly, it's called pericardial effusion. And if it increases suddenly, it's called as cardiac tamponade. Okay, the treatment would be to remove the pericardial fluid. Now let's see like what is seen inside the heart. The human heart is made up of four chambers. Okay, the four chambers are right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium and left ventricle. So there are four chambers in the heart. Okay, so here you can see the right atrium, right ventricle, left atrium, left ventricle. Now between the right atrium and the right ventricle, there is a valve. Okay, all the impure blood, all the impure blood from our body is poured into the right atrium. Okay, we will see the blood vessels which pour the blood into the right atrium. Okay, so the impure blood, impure blood means what? Deoxygenated blood. That is the blood which doesn't contain oxygen. Okay, or less number of oxygen. Okay, so that enters into the right atrium. Okay, so initially the right atrium will expand. So it will collect all the blood from the body. Okay the impure blood into the right atrium. Now the right atrium contracts. When the right atrium contracts, the blood goes from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Okay, as it passes from right atrium to right ventricle, there is a valve, okay, which makes sure that the blood goes only in one direction. Okay, so the blood always flows from right atrium to right ventricle. What is the name of this valve which protects between right atrium and right ventricle? 
it is the tricuspid valve okay the tricuspid valve okay the tricuspid valve is located between the right atrium and the right ventricle okay now the right from the right ventricle the blood goes through another tube okay another blood vessel what is the name of this blood vessel this is the pulmonary artery okay so for the pulmonary artery is the one which is connected to the lungs okay you know the function of lungs is to take in oxygen and release carbon dioxide okay so the impure blood from the right ventricle then goes through this artery which is the pulmonary artery okay and then into the lungs okay so now this is also one unidirectional flow so when the right atrium contracts it goes into the right ventricle now when the right ventricle contracts the blood will go only into the pulmonary artery because the tricuspid valve will be closed okay so backward flow is prevented it's only one way okay so the blood goes from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery okay it goes into the pulmonary artery now here also there is a valve okay and this valve is called as pulmonary valve okay pulmonary valve another name for pulmonary artery is pulmonary trunk okay pulmonary trunk okay so we have seen two valves tricuspid valve which is found between the right atrium and the right ventricle and pulmonary valve which is located between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery okay so the blood goes through the pulmonary valve into the pulmonary artery and then it reaches the lungs now in the lungs all the carbon dioxide is left out and the oxygen is taken okay so the oxygen is taken up and the carbon dioxide is released okay so now the blood turns pure okay pure means oxygenated blood the blood is rich in oxygen now this oxygenated blood comes into the left atrium okay it comes to the left atrium how it comes into the left atrium from the lungs through pulmonary veins okay through pulmonary veins okay note down that artery contains the pulmonary artery contains deoxygenated blood and the pulmonary vein contains oxygenated blood okay unlike the other arteries in all other places if you see the artery contains oxygenated blood and the vein contains deoxygenated blood okay so the usually the arteries contains pure blood and the veins contain impure blood but there is an exception in the heart in the heart the pulmonary artery contains deoxygenated blood whereas the pulmonary vein which comes from the lungs to the heart it's called as uh, the pulmonary contains oxygenated blood now from the left atrium the blood the pure blood then goes into the left ventricle how it goes into the left ventricle once again there is a valve okay and this valve is called as mitral valve or bicuspid valve okay mitral valve or the bicuspid valve now finally from the left ventricle it has to go to all the other parts of the body how it goes so from the left ventricle it then enters into the aorta okay it then enters into the aorta okay so this is called as ascending aorta arch of aorta and descending aorta so it enters into the aorta which is also guarded by a valve which is called as the aortic valve okay so there are four chambers and four valves right atrium right ventricle left atrium left ventricle what are the four valves the mitral valve the tricuspid valve which is located between right atrium and right ventricle the mitral valve which is also called bicuspid valve so this is located between the left atrium and the left ventricle 
the pulmonary valve is located between right ventricle and the pulmonary artery or trunk and the arch of aorta that's located in between the left ventricle and the aorta all right so these are the four valves and the four chambers any doubts until now no doctor okay. coming to the next one as i said before the valves they help in unidirectional flow okay so they help in the flow of the blood in one direction how come it helps the blood to go only in one direction because of the presence of valve that we know and these valves are attached to the ventricles it is attached to the ventricles especially the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve they are attached to the ventricles how is it attached to the ventricles it is attached into the ventricles by means of small thread like structures which is called as cordae tendini okay cordae tendini okay so the cordae tendini helps the valves okay so that the blood goes one day in one direction cordae tendini okay and where is this cordae tendini getting attached it is attached into the ventricular walls by means of small projections which is called as papillary muscles so both the right ventricle and the left ventricle they have got a large number of papillary muscles now this from the, the papillary muscles the cordae tendine goes and gets attached to, to the valves okay the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve okay this small thread like structures they are called as cordae tendine and the rough muscular part of the ventricle that's called as papillary muscles okay now this is the final picture showing you the different how the blood goes from one part to another so here the right atrium the blood is collected from the right atrium through the superior and the inferior vena cava okay you can see the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava the deoxygenated blood enters into the right atrium and from the right atrium it goes into the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve okay and from the right ventricle it enters into the pulmonary trunk through the pulmonary valve okay it then goes into the lungs and the lungs it gets to, it turns into pure okay or oxygenated blood the oxygenated blood enters into the pulmonary vein into the left atrium and from the left atrium it goes into the left ventricle okay which is guarded by the mitral valve from the left ventricle it then enters into the aorta which is guarded by aortic valve okay so this is the circulation of blood all right so this is another picture showing the same thing how the blood flows in different directions now the heart is uh, it's a muscular structure and for its function it also needs its own blood supply okay so it's a living structure right so it also needs its own blood supply so what is the main artery which supplies the heart so there are two arteries which supplies the heart one is called as the right coronary artery and the other one is called as the left coronary artery okay the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery both this artery arise from aorta okay both this artery arise from aorta okay right coronary artery and the left coronary artery the venous drainage okay the venous drainage so once the heart uses the oxygen carbon dioxide will be released from the heart now this carbon dioxide the, from the muscles of the heart okay so when this carbon dioxide enters it has to go into the veins so which vein it goes it goes into the coronary sinus okay it goes into coronary sinus so this is the coronary sinus any doubts until now 
No, doctor. Okay. The next one is conduction of the heart. Okay, so the conduction of the heart. So you know that the heart beats by itself. How come it beats by itself? Because there is a stimulus which forms in the sinoatrial node. Okay, the sinoatrial node, which is located in the right atrium. Okay, so from there, the stimulus starts. Okay, so this place will keep on stimulating as long as we are alive. Okay, the sinoatrial node. The sinoatrial node is also called the pacemaker of the heart. Okay, pacemaker of the heart. So if the sinoatrial node is not working, then the heart cannot beat by itself. Okay, so from the sinoatrial node, the impulse goes to atrioventricular node. Okay, so here you can see from the SA node, it goes into atrioventricular node. Why this is called as atrioventricular node? Because it is located between atrium and ventricles. Atrioventricular node. Okay, which is found near the atrial septum. Atrial septum means between the right and the left atrium. It's called as atrial septum. Now from the atrioventricular node, it goes into bundle of his. And from the bundle of his, it goes into right and left bundle branches. And from the bundle branches, there will be some more fibers which emerges which are called as Purkinje fibers. I'll show you in this picture, the, the impulse starts from the sinoatrial node and then it goes into the atrioventricular node. From the atrioventricular node, it goes into the bundle of his. From the bundle of his, it goes into right and the left bundle branch. And from the right and left bundle branch, small fibers arise and those are called as Purkinje fibers. Okay, so this is the conduction system of the heart. Sinoatrial node, AV node, or atrioventricular node, bundle of his, right and left bundle branches, and Purkinje fibers. The nerve supply to the heart. You know that the, this is a node. Now what is the nerve which stimulates this heart? Okay, so there is the nerve which stimulates the heart Okay, and this nerve is called as the vagus nerve, also called as the 10th cranial nerve, not X. Okay, so this is the Roman letter. So this is the 10th cranial nerve. Okay, the 10th cranial nerve is called as the vagus nerve. This helps in the, excuse me, the heart to beat continuously. All right, any doubts? All right, the last one regarding the uh, myocardial ischemia. What is the myocardial ischemia? You know the layman's term, uh, term it as heart attack. Okay, so what is this heart attack? In medical terms, it is called as myocardial ischemia. Myocardial means heart, ischemia means loss of blood supply. Okay, that is the blood is that is the blood vessels which supply the heart. They undergo constriction, and when they are blocked, certain part of the heart dies because there is no oxygen supply to this portion of the heart. Okay, so they cannot function. Okay, so this blockage of coronary artery leading on to death of the heart heart muscle okay is called as myocardial ischemia okay myocardial ischemia so myocardial ischemia is due to blockage in the coronary arteries how many coronary arteries are there two right coronary artery and the left coronary artery okay so when these arteries are blocked okay the heart cannot survive okay the oxygen will be depleted there will be no oxygen and the part the tissue dies okay but how come 
a person dies when there is a heart attack so imagine the heart is pumping normally and if there is a block in one of the coronary arteries okay small part of the heart is damaged when this part of the heart is damaged the heart cannot pump enough blood when the heart cannot pump enough blood the oxygen does not enters into the brain and when there is no oxygen in the brain the person will die okay so that's why this is an emergency okay and it has to be treated immediately to serve the patients okay so myocardial ischemia all right so this is regarding the heart any doubts in this one the heart chapter no doctor no okay now let's start uh, once again Let's go on to the next part, which is called as systemic circulation. Okay, I'm starting this topic because this is a very big topic. Okay, and I want you to read it before you come for tomorrow's class. Okay, systemic circulation. Now, in this, we will be seeing about the different blood vessels which are present in our body. There are many number of blood vessels. which are found in our body but we are going to find only the major ones okay first let's see about the arteries you know the aorta which is arising from the left ventricle carries oxygenated blood and the aorta has got three parts uh, three parts the thoracic part of the aorta has got three parts which is ascending aorta arch of aorta and descending aorta there is an abdominal part of aorta also okay so in this picture here you can see this is the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery both of which are arising from both of which are arising from ascending aorta so this is the ascending aorta arch of aorta descending thoracic aorta okay and after it passes through the diaphragm it becomes the abdominal aorta okay so right coronary artery and left coronary artery are branches from ascending aorta okay so they are branches from the ascending aorta now from the arch of aorta there is an artery which comes towards the right side which is called as brachiocephalic artery okay so brachiocephalic artery brachiocephalic artery brachio means arm cephalic means head okay so brachiocephalic artery now this brachiocephalic artery is a small artery which divides into right subclavian and right common carotid the right subclavian goes and supplies the right side of the upper leg okay it goes and supplies the right side of the upper limb whereas the right common carotid goes and supplies the head and neck on the right side of our body okay the head and neck on the right side of our body is supplied by right common carotid artery okay so the right half of the brain it is supplied by the right coronary artery and the left side of the heart it is a, it's uh, supplied by the left common carotid artery okay so the branches from the uh, aorta is left coronary artery right coronary artery from the arch of aorta it is brachiocephalic artery which divides into right subclavian and the left sub left, right subclavian artery and right common carotid artery now on the left hand side there is left subclavian artery and in between the two there is left common carotid artery 
okay the left subclavian goes and supplies the left side of the upper limb okay and the left common carotid goes and supplies the left side of the head okay and the brain okay it goes and supplies the left side of the head and the brain okay so once again the branches left right coronary artery left coronary artery both are coming from the ascending aorta from the arch of aorta brachiocephalic artery which divides into right subclavian and right common carotid okay the next one is the left subclavian artery and in between these two is the left common carotid artery okay so these are the branches from the arches of aorta sometimes there will be pictures which comes in your exams they may give you an arch of aorta picture and ask you to identify which uh, which uh, what is the name of the blood vessel okay so you need to write down what is the name of the branch whether it is uh, right coronary artery or left coronary artery okay so you need to know all those things the next one we are going to see about the common carotid artery we have seen there is two common carotids right right and left common carotid artery okay so this common carotid artery divides see here this is the common carotid artery it divides into two parts one goes outside and supply the face which is called as external carotid artery and the and also it supplies the thyroid gland okay the other one which goes is inside it's called as internal carotid artery the internal carotid artery there are no branches in the neck okay and they supply the brain okay it supply the brain through the circle of villus okay so once again common carotid artery divides into external carotid artery which supply the head neck and face okay as well as the inferior thyroid okay the next one the internal carotid artery has got no branches in the neck okay it supplies the brain and they form circle of villus what is the circle of villus the circle of villus it is a small circle formed by arteries in the base of the brain so here you can see the base of the brain or the bottom of the brain here you can see a circle like artery okay there is a circle like artery and this is called a circle of villus it is formed by internal carotid artery you can see there the internal carotid artery and the basilar artery okay so internal carotid artery and the basilar artery so they both form the circle of villus now why there should be a circle of villus in the brain what happens if the circle of villus is not there okay you know that brain is a very important structure which helps in keeping us alive okay so there has to be continuous oxygen to the brain okay so there has to be continuous oxygen to the brain okay now suppose if there is a block on one side okay then the blood can go through the other side and supply the brain okay so that's why there is a large number of anastomoses okay anastomoses anastomoses means uh, like alternative channels okay like uh, anastomosis spelling a n a n a I'll just write it down so that you can note it down anastomosis okay so anastomosis okay so the, because the circle of villus forms an anastomosis between the internal carotid artery and the basilar artery okay what is the function of this anastomosis say for example if you are going in a car okay and there is a traffic jam okay so what do you do you take an alternative route right to reach your destination 
So similarly, the blood supply in the brain, because the blood supply to the brain is very, very important. Okay? So the circle of Willis helps in maintaining the blood oxygen levels in the brain. Okay? This circle of Willis is formed by internal carotid artery and the basilar artery. Okay? Now, the other arteries I will tell you later in tomorrow's session, but I suggest you to go through these slides. Okay, so next we will be seeing about the abdominal arteries, upper limb arteries, lower limb arteries, then venous drainage, both in the upper limb, lower limb, thorax, abdomen, head and neck. Okay, so I'll just stop it down here. The rest we will see in tomorrow's class. Do you have any doubts? No, doctor, thank you. No, doctor.